Chapter 9 Signs of the Times These had to be heady times for the disciples of Yahshua. They were finally, after three fascinating years of following him around, starting to see some vindication, some evidence that his ministry was paying off. They had heard the teaching. They had seen the miracles. They had been there when he had accepted the adoration of the throng that had gathered along the road from Bethlehem with their palm branches to witness the arrival of the perfect Passover lamb chosen by the high priest from the sanctified flocks at the city of David. Of course, neither the crowd nor the disciples understood that Yahshua himself was to be that sacrificial lamb before the week was out. They had witnessed the master's cleansing of the temple, proving to all that he was no ordinary rabbi, but a man who spoke with the authority of Yahweh himself. Three of them already knew it beyond the shadow of a doubt, for they had seen him transfigured into a being of indescribable glory before their very eyes not many weeks before. Yes, the future was looking bright for the followers of Yahshua. So it was in an upbeat mood that they strolled through the confines of Herod's temple like the country bumpkins they were, gushing at its magnificent architecture and massive stonework. Will the master make this his kingdom's headquarters? They sure don't build them like this in Capernaum. It was therefore something of a shock when Yahshua informed them that the whole thing was going to be turned into a pile of rubble. Later that day, or perhaps the next, the three who had witnessed his transfiguration, plus the brother of one of them, found themselves alone with the master, and they asked him the same thing you or I would have asked. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things, that is, the destruction of the temple, will be fulfilled? Mark 13, 3 through 4, also Matthew 24, 3, and recorded in Luke 21, 7. Here we go again, trying to sort out the answers to two questions at the same time. And the task isn't made any easier by the fact that Yahshua took the opportunity to teach them truths concerning events which they hadn't even asked about. How could they? Curiosity doesn't happen in a vacuum. Remember, they all still thought that Yahshua's earthly reign was about to begin. Yahshua saved the first question, when, for later. Instead, he launched into a discourse that explained the signs and circumstances surrounding not only the impending sack of Jerusalem that would leave not one stone upon another, but also the last days of planet Earth, to which there are some striking parallels to Titus's 70 A.D. offensive. Once again, we see prophecies with near and far fulfillments delivered in the same breath. But since this is our jigsaw puzzle to work out, let's take all the pieces out of the box that look like they might fit and examine them one by one. Yeshua answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for these things must happen. But the end is not yet. Mark thirteen five through seven, also Matthew twenty four four through six, and Luke twenty one eight and nine. He began with a warning of false messiahs showing up. Luke's version adds that they will say, "The time has drawn near," and warns, "Therefore do not go after them." The word "he" in "I am he." was supplied by the translators. It isn't really there. Yahshua is warning us about men who say, I am. In other words, claiming on some level equality with Yahweh. There have been many through the ages enjoying varying degrees of temporary success. As the end approaches, expect to see more Muhammad, Hitler, Jim Jones, or David Koresh types attracting gullible followers. It bears pointing out that the phenomenon of rumors of war 
didn't really get off the ground until late in the 19th century. Only in recent years have we had the technological capacity to hear about every little conflict that might or might not be happening in the world. Yahshua knew there would always be wars. We're fallen creatures. They're in our nature. But we aren't to mistake our detailed knowledge of current events for the end of the world. Ignorance may pass for bliss, but enlightenment doesn't have to ruin your whole day. And as for false Christs, they fall into two categories, those pretending to be godly and those who admit to no God whatsoever. They both say the same thing, I have the answer, follow me. The first group attempts to undermine the church from within, and the second attacks from outside. Some in the false godly group lean toward legalism, the piling up of rule upon rule until the underlying truth is buried under a mountain of minutia. The law of the Sabbath, for example, had been given to instruct the people about Yahweh's grand plan. The Jews turned it into an onerous burden, specifying precisely how far you could walk or how much you could pick up without becoming a heinous lawbreaker. And how in the world do the Roman Catholics get the doctrine of priestly celibacy out of... A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. 1 Timothy 3.2 Later in that very same passage, Paul actually calls such synthetic legalism demonic. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own consciences seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Others in the destroy from within crowd are merely in it for the money or the power of the sex. These gurus in Rolls Royces are easy enough to spot, but their message tickles the ears so nicely people follow them in droves anyway. Make no mistake, these slick talkers are not the semi-harmless parasites they seem, but dangerous heretics. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there were false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their deceptive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit. The King James renders that make merchandise of you with deceptive words. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3. At some level, the false prophet syndrome applies to anyone who puts self or things before God, whether they're religious or not. Paul warns us that things will get worse as we approach the end. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins and lead away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Second Timothy 3, 1-7 these epithets were applicable to some extent in Paul's day, of course, but who can deny that they are more than descriptive of today's world? They are characteristic of our entire generation. These traits define the age we live in. As such, this kind of behavior has come to seem normal. Everybody's doing it. But we have been warned, these are indicators that we are in the last days. There is peril here. Turn away. 
Humanity has made such great scientific strides in the last century, it's no wonder many have come to regard, in their hearts if not with their lips, science and technology as the new gods. As we ease into the 21st century, the salient question is no longer, can we do it, but should we? But having declared ourselves, or worse, the work of our hands, as God, we no longer have any basis upon which to answer our own question. If the theory of evolution is fact, and it's not, by the way, then why should we do anything that isn't in the interests of our own short-term self-preservation or gratification? There's nothing left to do but mock those naive throwbacks of a quaint and bygone era that truly believe in one all-powerful Creator God. On the other hand, that very Creator God saw this attitude coming and warned us about it a couple of thousand years before it happened. Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Master Yeshua, the Messiah. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Jude 17 through 19. Jude was referring to what Peter had said. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all these things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water in the water. By the word of God the word that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Second Peter 3, 3-7 through 7. In other words, these scoffers believe that Noah's flood is just a myth told to entertain and intimidate small children. I don't believe it ever really happened, so you can't frighten me with wild tales of a coming judgment by fire. If God didn't judge us then, I'm sure he's not going to start now. The bad news is that what you don't know can kill you. Back on the Mount of Olives, Yahshua continued his discourse describing what the world will be like as we approach the end. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. In other words, birth pangs. Mark 13.8 also Matthew 24, 7 and 8, Luke 21, 10 and 11. The Luke passage adds, There will be pestilences. Some of these signs are man-made. We've heard about so many wars and rumors of war, we've almost gotten used to it. Famine is the inevitable result of prolonged war, for war interrupts whatever productive activities a nation may have had going for it, including the production and distribution of food. But you don't need war to experience famine. It could be caused by errant political theories, such as we saw in the USSR and China under communism. And wherever Islam makes inroads, poverty and strife invariably raise their ugly heads, for Islam is a doctrine that promotes piracy and plunder, not productivity and prosperity. Famine follows folly. I offer Ethiopia and the Sudan as 20th century examples. Pestilence, or disease, has always accompanied war, though any disruption in the fabric of society, cultural, political, or even weather-related, can promote the spread of disease. For the last hundred years, pandemics have swept the globe every thirty years or so, as if to remind mankind that even with all our scientific knowledge and pride in our ability to manage our environment, we are still pitifully impotent. Recently, pestilence has been promoted from war's byproduct to part of the very arsenal. Anthrax, smallpox, Ebola, and bubonic plague are being cultivated as weapons of war, 